today's episode, we're gonna go into some real horse country, the country of Mongolia. You know, a lot of the modern day processes we use for a Western saddle horse were invented by the Mongolian warriors over a thousand years ago. But we're not gonna go there for the horses. We're there after trophy Siberian Ibex. We're gonna take our Western hunting techniques all the way east, as far east as we can go, and see if we can put some big trophy Ibex on the ground. And it's gonna be a heck of a trip just getting to camp. It begins with a legendary pioneer in wildlife filming. Wilderness, adventure, and fair chase trophies define him. A son adds to the legacy and becomes the voice for a generation of hunters. Today, the third generation pursues trophy big game in places where success comes from skill, determination, and grit. Now, 60 years of hunting tradition comes down to one defining moment. We're the Eastmans. We've been filming and hunting for over 60 years and three generations. And these are just a few of our adventures. This is Eastman's Hunting TV. It's big game hunting, and it's as real as it gets. After making connections to Denver and Los Angeles, we're finally preparing to bid farewell to the United States as we board our first international flight across the Pacific Ocean. 12 hours later, we touch down in Seoul, South Korea only to hurry through another crowded airport on the way to our next connection to Beijing, China. Needless to say, after spending 24 hours straight in the airport system, we're in dire need of some time to recover and get acclimated to the 12-hour time difference. With a two-day layover in Beijing, we took advantage of the opportunity to visit some of China's most historic landmarks. First up, was the Tiananmen Square and the Forbidden City. Our last stop in China was at the Great Wall, one of the eight wonders of the world and home of some of the most treacherous stairways we'd ever seen. <laughs> the next day, we touched down at the Chinggis Khan International Airport, located on the outskirts of Ulubantar, Mongolia. One last plane leg. There's been six or seven flights on this trip, and this is the last. Out to Altai on a 10 hour Jeep ride, Russian Jeeps up the road. So I'm glad to have the airplane part of this whole thing over with, at least one way anyway. Altai. After touching down in Altai, we're finally done with flights as the rest of the journey to camp will be over land. The trip across the Gobi Desert in a uh, Russian Jeep is a very bumpy and uh, unique ride. Not so much different than antelope hunting in Wyoming. Luckily, after letting things cool down for a while, the Jeep fired up and we were off to the races. Almost 12 hours later, we arrived in camp with just enough time to unpack and get two hours of sleep before breakfast. in this uh, mountain range right here and looking for ibex in these pockets. Uh, it's reported that there's <clears throat> several bands in here so we're up here early in the morning first day of the hunt and uh, we got uh, a couple of the guides up here and they're going through and glassing and looking and seeing if they can't find a couple bands of ibex that we can hunt so hopefully they'll find a group or two <clears throat> and they'll go from there. 
wasn't long before one of the guides had spotted a band of ibex off in the distance. It'd be quite a steep climb to get a closer look. With a fake knee, Mike is no spring chicken. Slow but sure, he made his way to the top. Although they looked over several ibex, they never located a shooter. So it was back down the mountain they go. The following day, Mike began to feel sick. We still aren't sure how or where he picked something up. But let's just say for the next few days, things weren't pretty. Needless to say, they were forced to fire up the Jeep and take Mike back to camp, leaving Ike to fend for himself. Later that afternoon, Ike and his Mongolian guide were able to turn up a few good billies bedded in the rocks off in the distance. Without a cameraman, Ike was forced to take matters into his own hands. Before they popped up over the rise above the ibex, Ike traded the camera for his gun. Although this was a very close shot, it seems like Ike might still have a little jet lag left in his system. Finally, things began to look up for Ike on the fourth day of the hunt, as he and his guide located a band of billies working their way across a distant hillside. After spending over six hours on the move, they finally turned up one of the large billies bedded on a hillside under some rocks and moved him for the stock. managed to get into position without spooking the billy. But Ike knows all too well that these ibex won't stick around long after they've been spooked. He's ready to take the shot as soon as the billy stands up from his bed. It was hard to see in real time. But because they were so close to the ibex, the bullet hit square on the shoulder and zipped right through. Well, this is a this is our 2012 ibex hunt. It's been unbelievable. It resembles high country mule deer hunting. You're finding glassing points or vantage points, and and glassing down inside these bulls. So you got to use, use really good optics. I mean, you got to be able to judge them. One thing you look at is this hook, how far this hooks down, and then if you can look when this way, how far it flares out. See how it flares out? Thanks for watching Eastman's Hunting TV. And remember, fair chase is the only way to hunt and take trophy big game, no matter what side of the world you're on. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel right here for Eastman exclusive web content.